Welcome back to the Underwear Podcast. And this is a special mini bonus episode that we put up on Patreon and on our iTunes bonus thing where I'm going to talk about the fascinating case and recent quote unquote disappearance of La Barbie, who is otherwise known as Edgar Valdez Villarreal. He's this you know, American, Mexican-American, I think, drug lord who just happened to be raised and you know, born and raised and grew up in a middle-class, all-American life in the suburbs of Texas before becoming this just psychopathic killer who rose up to the top of the Mexican cartels. And I am your host, Danny Gold. Sean is not with me because this is a bonus, so you guys are going to have to make do without his, you know, terrible jokes interjecting on me discussing plot points. But I think we actually talked about La Barbie a little bit gave a, you know, something I think that's similar to this rundown in the Acapulco episode from maybe a year ago, uh, where I talked about how crazy the city had gotten, all the murders there. Uh, that was based off a PBS NewsHour story I did reporting down there in, um, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018. But yeah, it was, uh, it was wild. And he plays a big role in why the city has got so violent. So if you haven't been paying attention at all, he recently disappeared from federal prison, from custody in the U.S., and the Mexican government is pissed off. They're trying to get answers from the U.S., but um, you know, disappeared is maybe the wrong word. They're just saying they have no records of him where he is right now. And my completely unsubstantiated, just unresearched theory is that he's probably in Witsec or either released, you know, in in, in um whatever it is, uh, or in like a special facilities holding cell for snitching or informing on high level Mexican officials. That just kind of makes sense because I think he was sentenced to 50 years or so, but he's definitely giving someone up. And as you'll see, he didn't have, um, you know, a ton of info on any guys that are still out there because he had been uh, imprisoned years and years ago. So I don't know, hopefully we'll uh, eventually find out, but I'm going to get moving on this. So a lot of it is based off of at least the beginning, a Rolling Stone article from 2011 by Vanessa, I'm going to mispronounce her last name, Giordaris, who actually has written a lot of profiles, but this one kind of seems a little um, different from what she normally does. And Mary Kadehi, Kadehi? I don't know. I definitely mispronounced those two names, but they did fantastic work. I'm really surprised this hasn't been turned into a movie. La Barbie is the only U.S. citizen who had risen that far in the drug cartel world. He grew up in Laredo, Texas. He was this popular high school football player, and he got his nickname because he was this good looking, you know, fair complexion dude who resembled a Ken doll. He's a bit of a jokester, you know, a bit of a prankster as they always are, but he wasn't that sharp a student. So even though his dad kind of pushed him to go to college, it didn't really work out. And just a quick note, Laredo, which is his hometown, it's directly on the border, right? It's a border town of Mexico and it's the largest commercial land route between Mexico and the US, or it was back then. It's a good place to get started in the game, obviously, which is what he did. And he starts moving weed across the border and quickly realizes how much cash could be made. By the age of 20, he's moving 150 pounds at, at a time. This is you know mid 90s, early 90s. And like any good trafficker businessman, he expands into Coke and starts getting further down the supply line. He's getting it in and then distributing it to mid-level guys in Louisville and Memphis. And I'm sure that US citizenship definitely kind of helped him you know, getting back and forth across the border, especially back then. At 21, he marries his high school sweetheart. You know, it's very John and Diane. And he just keeps on moving up the, the ranking. He's a sharp guy. From the 2011 article on the Barbie from Rolling Stone, quote, I met him at a Popeye's in town to do a deal for 300 pounds of marijuana, recalls Martin Queller, a sheriff in Laredo, who was working undercover at the time. He seemed ready to work with me, but then he stopped answering his phone. I guess he smelled something. But, you know, he wasn't that sharp. And in 1998, at the age of 25, he finally gets busted. The police get an informant in his operation, and him and a bunch of his men are indicted for shipping 700 pounds of wheat to San Antonio and 133 pounds to St. Louis. La Barbie decides he's not going to risk it. He flees across the border to Mexico. He's on the lam, and he sets up shop in the town across the border, Nuevo Laredo, right across from his hometown. And then he just kind of starts sharpening his skills as an independent trafficker, right? He's buying his coke and paying a tax to this narco named Garcia, but he keeps a low profile. He's strict with his men. He demands they never come to work drunk or high, that they don't harm women or children. And he wants his men to be like, you know, polite, clean cut, all that sort of stuff. He's a, he's a businessman. He's efficient. In 2002, though, things are popping off uh, where he operates and the Zetas are moving in. Quick reminder again, 
The Zetas are a group of Mexican special forces soldiers who started off, you know, they went corrupt. They started off as the enforcement wing of the Gulf cartel, but they split off into their own thing at one point, And they're just absolutely effective murderous lunatics. They, they're seen as having brought the cartel wars to a different level of violence. Bad guys, you know, not, not good. At this point though, they're still in alliance with the Gulf guys. They kill Garcia and they start taxing everything, including La Barbie. And he can't really do anything to them because like I said, you know, special forces, killer lunatics with a lot of power and the Gulf cartel behind them. So there's not, he doesn't really have a choice in the matter. Within a year though, their leader gets arrested. The Gulf cartel leader gets arrested and Barbie kind of see, senses weaknesses, right? This is a bold guy. And he stiffs the alliance on the tax. They place a bounty on his head. So he links up with the Beltran Leva organization, which at that point, it's a bunch of brothers. We've talked about them in other episodes as well. And they're aligned with the Sinaloa cartel, headed by El Chapo, of course. And he had ordered them to take that territory, Nuevo Laredo. And this often gets confused a lot, I think, in, in a, lot of, a lot of media. The Sinaloa cartel, it's not a typical cartel with one top chief, as it's portrayed in a lot of news at a lot of times and, and you know, fictional things with the chief being El Chapo. It's more like a federation of groups that pool resources and work together. And El Chapo kind of gets too much credit for being the top Sinaloa leader. It's El Mayo who is probably more powerful. Uh, and he preferred for Chapo to be the face of the cartel because, you know, he's a smarter guy, wanted to play the background. Anyway, La Barbie goes to Arturo Beltran, who is the brother who's the head of the, the organization, to protect him and join forces. And Arturo sees his value since Barbie knows both sides of the border and the alliance is kind of sealed. In 2005, this war between these various organizations kicks off and there's about 150 murders in Nuevo Laredo, most of them because of this cartel war. La Barbie, he's like sending out hit squads of 10 to 15 Sicarios looking for Gulf cartel members and also for police officers that were tied to them. And it gets really brutal, even for Mexico cartel standards. Um, but he just can't compete with the Zetas, right? They, they are just incredibly dangerous at that point. And uh, he's outgunned, he's outmaneuvered by the Zetas' military expertise and connections. And he loses the crossing. But Beltran really likes him, and they kind of hire him to go become the manager of another enforcement wing called the Patrol, which operates in Alpolco, uh, Acapulco, where they run things. And Acapulco, it's good to him. You know, he's like playing tennis and drinking moe, very uh, 1970s celebrities in Acapulco. But he's also torturing his rivals with chainsaws and soundproof torture rooms, which I think, you know, Sinatra and co. didn't really get involved in that, that part of the Acapulco lifestyle. The Zetas send a bunch of Sicarios after him. You know, he's wanted, they, they money on his head, but he's tipped off by police. He actually catches one of them with his wife and kid, but he lets them go. And then he films the brutal interrogation and torture of the man and, and murder. And he sends it to the press, which kind of cements his reputation as the psycho. And that eventually makes its way to the Dallas Morning News, which was his, you know, kind of hometown paper. And it's widely read there. And this thing, it's normal now, but back then, it was a pretty unique thing. You know, there was no YouTube back then. Or there might have been, I don't know, 2005, 2006, whatever. He filmed this murder and broadcast it like that. So that was, that was different. It wasn't like a standard thing that we see now where there's a million videos out there like this. And in this next kind of bizarro La Barbie move, he takes out a full page ad in a major Mexican newspaper where he blames the Zetas for the ongoing violence. And it says, quote, end the great cancer of narco kidnappers and murderers of women and children. I may not be a white dove, but I am sure of what I've done and what I'm responsible for. And the Mexican press kind of eats it up. He becomes this like a celebrity narco, I guess. They chronicle his exploits. You know, he buys all these like nightclubs and he shoot, shut them down just to go party. He dates a famous Mexican soap opera star. It's just, just wild stuff. And he even demands he goes by this new nickname of El Senor because the Zetas start to spread rumors about him, you know, because he's clean cut, that he's gay which, uh, yeah, just weird, weird media stuff in this story. But things are kind of looking up for him at that point. He's living it up in Acapulco. He's under the protection of Bel the Beltran Leva organization. But all that changes in 2008, in January, when Alfredo, a brother, is arrested in Culiacan. You know, him and the other brothers are, are furious because they're supposed to have protection there. Culiacan is it's the heart of Sinaloa. So it's where like El Chapo is supposed to have things on lock. Rumors start to spread. Of course, these guys always betray each other that Chapo helped give him up. 
right? Because he was envious of the power, the growing power the the Beltran organization had and that Barbie had in Acapulco. And then it's just an all out war between the groups. And this is kind of what kicks off Acapulco becoming a real bloodbath. Um, a few months after the arrest, one of El Chapo's sons is gunned down. And on the same day, assassins ambush Mexico, Mexico's new federal police chief. And soon bodies are just piling up all over the Pacific coast. And the president of Mexico sends in thousands of military police. 500 something people die in this war, including like 65 policemen. And then one night in December of 2009, Arturo, who, you know, had a, had a pretty bad coke problem at that point, he's up partying with all these strippers and Mexican special forces. They storm his estate. In the ensuing chaos, he slips away with a couple of trusted men, but to like a, a hideaway condo. But just a few days later, Mexican commandos, again, with helicopters and armored vehicles, they storm it. And uh, Arturo actually calls La Barbie for help to send more men so they can shoot it out. But he kind of realizes that Arturo's finished and he doesn't doesn't respond to the call. Arturo's gunned down and the Beltrons, like right away, they go to the family home of one of the commandos and at the funeral of one of the commandos, they gun down his mom, his brother, his sister, his aunt, all that sort of stuff, just, just chaotic stuff. And uh, Hector, one of the other brothers, thinks that Arturo should have been a little more secure in his estate in that area and that it's someone close who gave him up and he blames La Barbie for it. So, you know, these guys, first they turn on other people, then they turn on each other. It's just nonstop. That's kind of how the narco wars go. At this point, Hector links up with the Zetas, who are, again, once his rivals. And La Barbie does the same with a powerful lieutenant from the Beltran organization who went by the Indian and had split with them. And uh, he sets up his own shop called the Independent Acapulco Cartel. So, yeah, he's this, you know, American entrepreneur, whatever it is, and he's running a cartel in Mexico. And then, of course, there's a new war the Belgians are still pretty powerful with their own connections to the Mexican army and uh, they're going after La Barbie, but there's, you know, he's getting raided all the time. At one point, there's a story about him escaping on a motorcycle, wearing a backpack of grenades where someone alleges that he yelled out, look at me, I'm Rambo, which kind of sounds made up, but you know, basically it sounds like he's losing his mind. That's what his associates, his former associates would say. Bodies are piling up. He's outgunned and outmaneuvered. Eventually, he gets busted by the police in Mexico, and after a period of time, he's extradited to the U.S. for just a whole bunch of charges. And one of the interesting things is he had been talking to the DEA for, for years at that point, trying to cut a deal. And he wanted immunity from prosecution and then be allowed to walk into the U.S. with $5 million, which, you know, shoot for the stars when you're negotiating. You know, go, uh, go for the top because it can, all they can do is say no, you know, and he really took that to heart. It turns out he's actually the one that turned on Arturo Beltran, as the brothers had suspected, because he wanted to take over the organization. He was playing both sides with the DEA too in case it didn't work out. But by the time he's extradited in 2015, it's determined that his information at that point was old and useless. And in June 2018, he sentenced to 49 years in prison in the US. And so just recently, as I don't know why they were pressing him, pressing the feds, but the Mexican government was was asking the feds like, "What's up with with La Barbie? What, what what's going on with him?" And they said, as of November thirtieth, he is no longer in federal custody. The exact quote is, "We do not provide specific information on the status of inmates who are not in the custody of the BOP for safety, security, or privacy reasons. Inmates who were previously in BOP custody and who have not completed their sentence may be outside BOP custody for a period of time for court hearings." medical treatment or for other reasons. So I guess the medical treatment thing could be something. Maybe they don't want to give up his, his whereabouts because definitely a lot of people that are very scary want him dead, but I don't know, man. I think the the state's evidence thing sounds pretty on point. And the questions and conspiracies, they've begun all over, you know, including by me at the start of this and right now. So where is he? You know, the BLO, the Beltran Leva organization is defunct. And uh, most of the brothers are dead or arrested. All of his information would have been old and useless in 2015, 2016. And he had split from them even before that. Uh, he hasn't testified, to, to my knowledge, in any drug cartel trial. He wasn't involved in El Chapo's trial, as far as we know. He was too far removed, kind of, to, to do so. You know, El Mayo and, and uh, El Mayo's son and brother testified against El Chapo. And that's kind of as high level as you can get in the Sinaloa cartel. So it's not information on them. He might have been a longtime informant. We don't really know. 
And we don't want to go too far off the rails here, but there's definitely been a lot of shady shit that's gone down with the DA um, and, and the feds and, and the government in general when it comes to the Mexican cartels and getting people that turn state's evidence and all that sort of stuff, favoring one cartel over another, all sorts of accusations and, and some pretty good evidence on stuff like that. Yeah, that's the story right now. We, we just don't know where he is. The Mexicans are pissed off. So we actually put this story up first on Instagram. You can follow us there at underworld underscore pod, I think, or the underworld podcast is the accounts. Um, we post crime stories daily. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe, like, comment, all that. It really helps with the algorithm, which is holding us down. So write a comment, do all that stuff. Ratings and comments on iTunes, Spotify, all the usual crap. And thank you again for tuning in. I promise you next time we'll have Sean making just awful jokes to keep everyone going.